Welcome to Control Your Career, a podcast to help you conquer uncertainty, shatter imposter syndrome, and rise above the expectations imposed by others. My name is Julia Toothaker, and I am the career coach and strategist at Ride the Tide Collective, my career development company where I offer career coaching courses, and I have a plethora of free content. I have been doing this work for over a decade, and I want to help empower professionals like you to find clarity, navigate your current career with finesse, and propel yourself toward career advancement in alignment with your unique personality, preferences, and values. This podcast is a great place to start your journey toward controlling your career. Season 10 is all about managers and specifically what managers want and expect from their employees and teams. I've brought on people managers with at least 10 years of experience managing who are also currently managers to help you understand their mindset and expectations. Each episode will have action items that you can apply to your unique situation and consider in your relationship with your manager. You can find this episode and more at ridethetidecollective.com. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post career information and inspiration to help you control your career. Welcome, everyone. We are back for the manager's perspective. And my guest today, we met through another event that we were both doing John Harper is the regional VP in the sales division for a large human capital management organization. And I heard him on a panel for an event that I was also presenting at. And I knew that I had to have him on a get on have him on as a guest. John, thank you so much for being here and agreeing to impart your wisdom to my audience. Yeah, of course, Julie. It was great to uh, be a part of that event with you. Had a, had so much fun just being able to add value to uh, hundreds of people that able were able to join us. And excited to be on today. Excited to be able to uh, to uh, answer some questions for your listeners and uh, and hopefully leave them with something to take away. So yes, I love that. Okay, we're just gonna jump right in, and I want you to tell us who you are. Talk about your career up to this point, and specifically what got you into people management. Yeah, so um, so I've been in leadership and people management for gosh, this is year nine. Um, so, you know, I I got warned when I uh, decided when I was considering getting into people people leadership. Uh, hey, don't don't do it for the money because sometimes performers can can out out uh, out earn you. You got to do it because you're passionate about it. And luckily for me, that lined up with what my values were. And so. Like my big my big passion is seeing people win, seeing people grow and evolve. And um, you know, I've uh, this is this is such a such a fun journey to go on as you watch people hit their goals and and evolve into the people they want to be. Right, like at the end of the day, um, you know, yes, people have goals and aspirations and they want to climb ladders and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, like the, the the most fun part for me is watching people that maybe enter in an organization one way um, as a person, as a human, um, and then evolve into skill sets that not only help their jobs job, but it helps them as people and eventually, you know, maybe as parents or as spouses or as neighbors or as community members. And so um, that's what I'm passionate about as, as a people leader. And, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a really fun journey over the last nine years. Amazing. Okay. I want to provide some context because I think specifically being in sales, you've yep. been in sales for the majority of your career and yep. you went into people management and you mentioned it right at the beginning that if, if you're doing it for the money, yeah. you should have... <laughs> So can you talk a little bit, (laughs) I'm going a little off script here because I think in sales, this is something that I've had clients talk to me about where they're making such good money on the sales side, but they love the management side. So can you kind of talk about that dichotomy and maybe choosing to step away from like straight sales and going into the people management side? Yeah, I mean, it is. And you use the right word, right? It's a dichotomy that you have to choose what you know, there is a tension there. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, full, full disclosure, I don't want to make it seem like it's, you know, I I don't want to put, you know, uh, glitter all over it. Like that there was a tough conversation that had to happen with my wife and I, where it's like, Hey, this is what I'm passionate about. And, um, and it, and it just wasn't, wasn't all about the money. It's not that I don't make good money, what I'm doing, but 
you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I just have a belief system that, that I don't want to get to the end of my life and be somewhere, um, that, that I have a lot of money, but I wonder what if mm. in my purpose, if that yes, makes sense. Right. Absolutely. So for me, I, I got there fairly <laughs> early. I was very fortunate to get there fairly early in my, in my career. And I believe that like a lot of people face a lot of those pivot points, um, or injunction points where it's like, man, this has been fulfilling for, you know, three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, whatever, whatever that is. Um, and you feel yourself pulled to, to a different level of your purpose. And for me, when I got into people leadership, that's what that was. It was, Hey, mm. I did, I did fairly well in sales, um, you know, and, and made really good money. Um, but I just, I, I've always, you know, um, I go back to, uh, something that my grandfather told me when I was, when I was younger and, and, my grandfather died. The, the, the one that I'm talking about died when, when I was seven. And I still remember this conversation. He was just like, you will, you will look back on what you wanted to do, not what you did do. Mm. And I just, I didn't, I never wanted to like get to that point um, and wonder what if. And so for me, that was the pivot point. And I just, I just decided, Hey, listen, if I go all in on this, um, if I impact lives and make less money, it was okay with me. So um, luckily for me, I've made pretty good money and I've impacted some people along the way. Um, so it's it's worked out pretty good. Yes, I love that. Okay, we're we're not even five minutes into this and there's so much wisdom already being <laughs> shared. This is going to be such a great episode, John. <laughs> okay, let's... You've touched on this a little bit, but I want you to go through kind of more in depth with how would you describe your overall people management style with your teams and then how has that evolved over the years? Yeah, so man, the, uh, ooh, the I know this is a 30, 45 minute pod. Um, so evolution, I'm going to shorten for the sake of your audience. Um, but I got to tell you that the first time I was in, the, as I got into leadership, I I just wanted to be liked. Mm. Like uh, very, very straightforwardly. I, I wanted to be liked. I wanted people to like me. Um, I wanted to not stir the pot. And what I realized over time was is, is, is uh, clarity is kindness. And candor is kindness as a leader, um, and if you say it in a in a respectful and an, an empathetic way, um, it's not fair to people to not be candid with them. And especially in the sales side of an organization, you know, listen, like we're we're in a performance based side of the organization, right? So I have a responsibility to the organization to deliver on what the responsibility is, right? Um, and so to not be kind and candid with my people on where they stand is actually very um, you know, I kind of look at it as, as semi disrespectful to them mm. that they, a can't like, I, I kind of look at it as if I can't be candid with you, it's almost like a sign that you're not mature enough to handle it, which I don't, I don't think people feel that way. I think, yeah. I, I think leaders that shortcut their, their employees with trying to soften the blow, um, can come across a little bit, um, disrespectful and that like, Hey, I'm an mm -hmm. adult. Like, and I, I want to do better. And I believe that all of my people want to do better and they want to strive for excellence and they want to, to, to reach their potential. And so if I don't coach them directly in a loving, kind, empathetic way, I'm kind of cheating them. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. what's that, that's that evolution has become, and that's not a silver bullet, right? Some people do take that offensively and like, that's part of leadership and you gotta, you gotta add with that. Um, but I would say most people really do appreciate if you say it in a kind tone and, and have the right body language and do it in the right setting, they really do appreciate the clarity and the kindness um, that comes along with that candor. And, you know, listen, sometimes it's not a it's not a fit for the role. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's um, just time of life. And at the end of the day, like if they know I care about them as people, that clarity um it, it it goes a long way with, you know, just being direct and being honest and them not having to guess where they are. Yes. Okay. I I love this because this aligns so much with what I share with my yeah. clients and on social media. We talk a lot about how you're receiving information. And that's been a theme uh, this season on the podcast as well. You as an employee have to understand that I would say the majority of managers are not out to get you. They want to help you improve. And specifically mm -hmm. on the sales side, I, I love that you said that. Like you have to be so direct and so honest because it is performance based. So yeah. if you're not performing, <laughs> yeah. that's not good. We got we got to solve the problem. But so many people take feedback personally. 
And yeah. that's one thing that I try to impart onto people. It's like, is it you? Like, are you twisting something yeah. because of a past experience and you're putting that onto your manager? Or is your manager truly being unkind to you mm-hmm. and helping people discern that? So, oh, I love, I love that you said that. It's just it reinforcing <laughs> these yeah. messages for people. Ugh. Okay. So let's go into the hiring process. So I want to ask kind of a collection of questions, um, walking us through the hiring process for an employee. So let's start with when you are hiring somebody, what are you looking for on the resume and in the interview process? We want those like really tangible tips. Yeah. So I'm going to give you one tip on the resume and then I may throw a curveball and then I'm going to give you the, 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 the interview process if that's cool. Okay. That's great. So, <laughs> um, again, like coming from the sales side, right. I think, uh, candidates put way too much of what they do, not the results that they get. Right. So like as a, as a hiring manager, like a really easy tip for whoever's listening on the other side of this pod is like, I, I please don't take this disrespectfully. How you got it is less concerning that than to me than that you did get it. So mm. if you're again like th- this is coming from a sales lingo, right? So but if you're if you're 150 percent a plan ten years in a row and you don't have that on your resume, like that's a massive mistake. Right. But telling me I prospect people and I manage pipeline and I, like I'm gonna assume all that. I'm mm. I'm assuming if you're applying for a similar role, you're doing that. So the t- the tactical tip number one very little what I do every day, very um, much what the result is of what you do, right? So that's that's the resume side. The other side is, um, candidly, outside of what I just gave that little tip, ironically, I don't look at a resume. The only thing I look at as a resume is how, how did you perform and are you a risk to leave within 12 to 24 months based on previous mm-hmm. history? Those are the two things I look at as a leader of leaders. So okay. I le- right now, I lead three sales executives that have their own teams. The filter that I use is, are you gonna bounce in two years? Because remember, like I, again, like you mentioned at the top of the, uh, the top of the pod, I work for a Fortune 200 company. When you get a sales, and this is not to brag out, this more to brag on the company than anything else. When you get a role and you put that on your LinkedIn, you're gonna get hit up right now. Right. Like you're, you're, you're mm-hmm. automatically, you're going to get inquiries immediately. Right. So if I see, all right, you're going to be, you, your experience has told me you're going to be gone in 12 to 24 months. That's a little bit of a red flag. And then the other thing is like, then I look at the accomplishments. If I can check those two boxes, now I get, I want to talk to you. Mm. I want you. I want you as the person. Can you articulate? Can you navigate a conversation? Can you navigate a curveball thrown at you? Can you navigate an unexpected ask from me or my sales executives or, right? Like, because at the end of the day, again, this is this is me in sales, like, and and I say me in sales, but really like these days, Julie, like in business, every, every day there's a curveball. Every day there's a conversation that you think is going to go left that goes right. And if you can't navigate that, again, mm-hmm. like, so the, I would say 80% of my weight in terms of interviewing people is me and you having a conversation? Are you able to go with the flow? Are you able to be prepared and not panic? Are you able to articulate your value prop based on your past that you can bring into your future potentially with us? Um, those are the types of things I look for. And then I then I, every single interview, I always provide a piece of constructive feedback mid interview. And I want to see if you can, I want to see if you can adjust. <clears throat> because to me, this is my coaching to my sales execs. You can be the most talented person in the world if you can't take coaching. Like the world changes too much, yeah. right? To not take coaching. So if you can't, if you take coaching, you take it offensively or you say, oh, that totally makes, this happens a lot. That totally makes sense. And then you keep doing the same thing, right? Like you're that person and it doesn't, <laughs> right? And so if you're that person, I know, okay, this this may not be, right? The, the, the right yeah. fit. So. I know that's a, that's a little bit abnormal because most people want to focus on the resume and what to put and what not to put and how to articulate. Yeah. But for me, I want to know, is this person the right fit? And is this person somebody that we can depend on long-term right. and can adjust to coaching? Those are the things I look for. Oh, man. Okay. I'm sure you just ruffled some feathers. Yeah. <laughs> the way you said. Yeah. 
But here, okay, here's the context I want to provide as a career coach, because I think that what happens in terms of the noise out in the world is you need to have your resume and needs to look like this. And then you need to conduct the interview like this. And you have to do these things. And if you don't do these things and you're never going to get the interview and there's all these like absolutes out there and all this stuff. And constantly what I'm trying to tell people is you have no idea who the hiring manager is and what they care about. So you have to take this general advice Mm -hmm. and do the best that you can. So the benefit that you have right now is that if somebody is going to come work for you, they could listen to this podcast and hear this and know exactly what they need to focus on, on their resume and in the interview, right? That's the kind of research I think people need to be thinking about doing. But I... So the resume side, I want to say the focus on results, I will tell you almost every manager and every recruiter I have talked to says that. Yep. And if you are in sales, anytime I get a sales client, I'm like, oh, you're the easiest resume in the (laughs) world because it is all results. And if you can't produce those results, I'm like, you need to rethink sales. (laughs) It's not going to be a good, it's not going to be a good fit for you. So let's talk about that interview process. I think that's a very unique way to approach the interview. But I also think, again, this is so helpful for people to understand that there is no one size fits all to the approach. And when you're in sales, I feel like it's you have to be able to pivot the conversation because you never know who's going to be sitting across from you. But then also for you, you know, you have to find people that are going to, they're going to translate well, right? When, whether you're doing something over Zoom or you're in person, you want to get the, basically the vibe for that person for lack of a better phrase. For sure. Make sure that your clients are going to read well for them also, you know, like that you want to have that rapport. So I love your approach to, to interviews there. I think that's such a great, such a great way to go about it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's let's keep going through this process. So let's say you have a couple different candidates and you have two people who are very similar, which I yep. think happens in sales pretty often, right? You've got two yep. rock stars, they've got great numbers, they're reading really well. How do you decide between those two people? So I have this happen to your point often. Here's the technique I use. I will call both candidates and I will say, Hey, we're still, we will, we're we're still in the consideration process. Um, thought you did a great job. Uh, you're in the top, I'll, I'll, you know, usually it's like, Hey, you're in the top three candidates, right? Um, before we made our consideration, um, you know, obviously we want whoever is going to take, whoever we're going to make the offer to, we want to, we want, we want to give the best chance of to ourselves as an organization, Mm -hmm. the offer to be accepted. What questions do you have for me as we're still finalizing consideration? That gives me a window into... It doesn't mean that it, that, that it's the end-all be-all. Um, but the t- a tip for the listeners, right, is when that question's asked, um, it's probably not the... And we talked about this in the, in the w, WBL um, uh, po- uh, session. It's like, even then is probably not the time to be like, hey, so what's your, like, what's your policy on PTO? Or what's your, like, hey, like, walk me through the comp plan. or And it doesn't mean it's not relevant to you. Please, Mm -hmm. please don't, you know, for for the listeners, right? And for the the employee, like, that that doesn't mean it's not relevant. It's really important. Like, you want to make sure you're getting your worth. However, what that tells me as a hiring manager is you're more worried about what you're getting from the organization than what what you can give to it. Mm. And so to me, again, the interview process, you're probably going to show your best self there. Right. So if you're already going, talk to me about PTO, talk to me about, you know, flexibility with base, talk to me about uh, remote work options, talk to me about what, like, if that's already on your mind, Mm -hmm. that's only going to become exponential six months from now. Right. Right. So that's my technique when I have candidates and it usually irons itself out. It's, it's interesting that way. Um, because you know, I, the way I word it is a little bit of a, Hey, are you going to, where is your head really? Um, mm-hmm. and it opens a door a little bit to the people that have already been thinking this way, but they just didn't want to 
say. So tip to the listeners, like until you get the offer, like once you get the offer, negotiate. You have full, because for, for at that point, I know you're my, my, my gal or my guy, like we're going to hire you. So here's the other thing on the other side of that. Once I make an offer, I will be the advocate for you. If you say mm -hmm. I need an extra 5,000 bucks or whatever the number is, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. We had a, a candidate was coming from another large organization. Uh, they, they compared their benefits package to their current one and us. And it was like a $4,800 difference, right? Uh, annually for their family. I was on the phone with HR that day as the VP, as the regional VP on behalf of the candidate. Cause I was mm -hmm. like, this is the person we want. This is why I'm making a business case on behalf of the candidate at that point. Right? So just know if you're the candidate, if you prove yourself to be the right one throughout the entire process, I promise you, I'm not the only leader that will advocate for you and champion you coming on. So there will be a time for you to be able to negotiate there. And I, and I can guarantee and, and try, like, listen, for the employees, the, the recruiters get paid on placements too, guys. Right. So like, like they want, if I select you, they want you to come on board. So you now have a team of people working for you. So I'm just encouraging everyone listening. Like there is a time there. It's not like companies don't care about what your asks are. But mm -hmm. for me, when I make that call, when I have two, two employees that I, what I look for is, is your mindset truly in the, I want to add to the organization or is it mm -hmm. in the, well, what can I, I want to make sure I get what I need. I know that's yes. a long winded answer, but hopefully that helps. No, I think that's so helpful. And just to back that up, I had a client that that also happened to in a completely different industry, <laughs> a completely yeah. different part of the nation, different level as well. And so it was, it was actually same medical and the person really wanted them and ended up get, getting them about the same, like another $5,000 specifically to cover medical Yep. Cost. So it is possible to do totally. that. We just have two examples right there. 100%. Okay. I, I love all of this because this is so helpful for people to understand the thought process. And here's what I want to challenge people who are listening because I'm in the career space. So I see what other career coaches, and I'm using quotes for those listening yeah. because yeah. not everybody is qualified or has the experience to talk about these topics. Totally. Um, but there is a narrative right now around, you know, it's all about you as the employee, like get the yeah. bag, get whatever you can. It's all yeah. about you, the salary, all this stuff. And I get it. You need to have, you know, your threshold as an employee a hundred percent, but you have to be so cognizant of how that comes across. And I think that your example and talking about that is exactly why, because we have people that are saying fight for these things. It's corporate. Yeah. They don't care about you, all this stuff. And I'm like, you cannot have that attitude going mm. into an interview. If that is your attitude, you're not going to get chosen. Yeah. Right? So if you're somebody that's doing interviews right now, like check your mindset going yeah. into it. Like, do you have to play the game a little bit? Maybe, you know, maybe you need to yeah. switch your mindset for that interview, but you can't listen to the people that are telling you to be so selfish yeah. that it comes across negatively to the hiring manager. And this was a perfect example of why. And I, and I will tell y'all like, you can, I can read it. I, like I can feel it, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're all people. Like I can, I can see it, and it doesn't mean that it's not there. It may not be back end justification based on a previous experience or things of that nature. Um, but the worst, the the worst hires I make, um, or have made, I try to make less of them now. Uh, but the worst hires I make is when somebody has that demeanor. But I try to make excuses due to results because what mm -hmm. ends up happening is that heart posture carries over, and. I use this line a lot, and this is really only for corporate America, Fortune 500, but I'm going to use it because I feel like it's applicable to your audience is, you know, listen, myself and, and the people that I hire, I voluntarily work for a Fortune 200 publicly traded for-profit company. There are pros and cons to that, mm -hmm. right? The cons, as soon as they show up, if somebody shows up with a heart posture of you owe me, or I'm trying to get the bag, or I'm trying to get... As soon as the con of a Fortune 200 for-profit publicly traded company shows up, it's 
that's not fair. Why is that happening? And and you're 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 on a very like the slope is very tough to recover from. Yeah. So I I I feel um I I understand that like hey you don't want to get taken advantage of you want to get with your worth like I I got you like I'm with you right mm-hmm. um but just know like heart posture is important and and again I'm not saying this is exam- this is existing in every organization but there are leaders out there there are to me there are more of them than we realize that will fight for not only advocating for your initial pay or your initial compensation but will fight for your continual compensation and your continual advancement and you're like there are more of those than you think the bad people are just louder that's yes, all. yes. Oh, that's going to be a clip. <laughs> that is 100% going to be a yeah. clip. Hey there, Julia here. Is this episode resonating with you? Maybe it's got you questioning how you can better communicate with your manager, team, or just learn more about how to control your career. Well, I've busted into this episode to tell you about my career action coaching. Career coaching is more than job search and resumes. It's also about managing the day-to-day situations that come up in your career. This coaching option is perfect for the career management situations that you're dealing with, along with other career-related challenges or goals. This is a flexible coaching option to help tackle specific topics to move forward efficiently and confidently. Not all coaching requires a six month commitment. Career action coaching is three hour long sessions that can be customized to your unique needs. Before committing, let's discuss what you need in my complimentary career coaching clarity call. The link will be in the show notes and the description for this episode. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, I wanna go back. Um, You had mentioned in kind of the the resume interview that you try to look for people that have longevity. So they've been in positions for 12 to 20, 24 months, which I absolutely understand, especially in sales, because that's so much relationship building that has to happen and that takes time. Yep. Talk to me about how layoffs impact that because not only have I had clients impacted by it, but we're obviously seeing it everywhere, especially yeah. within tech. So what, what does that look like when you have people who don't have a choice in terms yeah. of, of longevity, yeah. you know, what, can you go into that a little bit more? hundred percent. And it's a reality, right? Like I think, you know, as the economy continues to be, um, wavy and we're going to, you know, we're in an election year, like th- there's uncertainty, right? So I, I think it's a good point. Um, the, the question I ask around layoffs is always the same, which is, Great. What have you been what have you been doing to prepare for the next role since? And if mm. the if the answer is something of the effect of, yeah, I've just really been putting my resume out there and I've really been I'm not saying that's the wrong answer. What I'm looking for is how are you preparing yourself? Because you know, very few, I'm not saying nobody, very few people are putting their resume out nine hours a day, five days a week. Right. Right. So, so what I'm looking for in that answer is candidly, like a lot of transparency. So I had a, I'll give you an example. So I had a candidate went through this, um, moved from Texas to New York, um, for a few years, pandemic happened. Obviously New York has much more, uh, stringent, had more, much, much more stringent, uh, COVID stipulations than a lot of States. And so, um, she was out of work for, I don't know, a year or so. Mm. Um, and when I asked that question, um, she was very, her answer was was the best answer I've heard, which it, which was something to the effect of, honestly, um, I started to to apply to a lot of places. It took me about a month to realize that I had a lot of free time on my hands, and it was really difficult. And I had to start doing some self discovery, and mm. um, I had I figured out that my my demographic, like I wanted, to, I knew my heart wasn't in this space anymore. I wanted to get into this space, so I started taking courses at night to do this. And it was really tough on me because I was a single mom. I'm a single mom of two kids. And so it forced me to, to and this is going to get deep a little bit, but again, it's like, it's to me as the hiring manager, it shows vulnerability to understand how to self-analyze how to evolve. She goes, I started, I have, I had to go start to go to therapy to figure out how to navigate being a single mom, unemployed and learn a new industry. And I was mm. like, and it, like, pl- please know, like that vulnerability is not required to get attention okay. from an employer. But what it did for me was like, she's a human. Yeah. Like she, 
you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it, it, it allowed me to see, oh, you're not trying to put a super, super woman cape on and be like, mm -hmm. I know I got laid off. I haven't had a job for a year. We're going to grind through it. Like, no, like, <laughs> like it's yeah. okay. And it doesn't, and she didn't say it in a tone of like, she wasn't throwing herself a pity party. She wasn't right. But she was, she was like, I, so what, what I had, what, and she, what she did was she looped it back around. She goes, so what I think that did for me was it gave me resilience that I didn't have in my previous careers, mm -hmm. which the next career I have will be able to allow me to evolve with whatever that whatever is going to come my way. And because I have tools that I didn't have before, I can now be a single mother to the two kids I have and not, not over rotate and take time away from them or my, mm -hmm. like she looped it back to the value of what we would get if we brought her on. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, and she had, obviously very she had thought about it mm -hmm. she was intentional but her she had a story behind it that allowed her a to be human and b to show her character within that story so that's probably a little bit deeper than your than your listeners wanted to go down that rabbit hole but i think it's it just shows like don't don't try to fake it don't yeah. don't you know yeah. show show what you really are doing and i think also like taking the time as you're you know going through the layoff season get better, get new skill sets. The world's evolving while you're while you're out of the workforce. So try to keep up as best you can. Yes, yes. And I want to put in my, my little tip here for people that are like, I don't have the money. I don't have this. Go to your library. Go oh. to your local library. I, I try to post this on LinkedIn like every couple yes. of months. Go to your local library and see what online resources they have because a lot of them have LinkedIn Learning or Coursera or some oh type gosh. of course course skill something or other so if if anybody is coming at us yes, about no. not having money go to the freaking library <laughs> i just saw i just saw a post uh from mit they're offering first year student courses for free online oh, mit yeah like, don't, there you so go. to your point julie like <laughs> you don't have to have you don't you don't have to spend ten thousand bucks to no. be like no. just use the resource you have when you're unemployed which is the mm -hmm. resource of time use it wisely you can get you can get farther than you think Yes, I love that. Okay, I want to shift into, you know, you have your team, you're hired as a manager, you're doing one-on-ones, right? What does that look for you? How does that look for you? Like, what is the structure? How do you conduct your one-on-ones? So my one-on-ones are um, semi-informal. They're structured, but they're semi-informal. Um, I don't talk about a lot of... Um, a lot of business in one-on-ones. I talk about, you know, again, on the sales side, like I talk about deals all day, every day. In a one-on-one, um, really, I want to figure out like, do you have do you have the, the tools that you need, the support you need to succeed at your job for that week? Because I have one-on-ones with my people every week. Um, hey, how are you feeling? Like, again, I lead leaders. So but even when I lead, led performers, it's like, hey, you know, what's going on this week? How can I help support? What do you need me to help you get in front of before this mm -hmm. happens? Um, and then probably once a month, I have a one-on-one -on -one that's just about career pathing. Mm, um, I love that. <laughs> and like, I, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a foundational belief as a leader that the, the, the possibility of, you know, all 25 people that work for me today, working for me five years from now is pretty zero. <laughs> Like, so like I, I look at it like uh, there's a big part of my job as a leader is, that is to prepare you for what's next, whether it's in this organization or not. Right. So I want to know what that looks like for you, whether that's you want to start a business in three years, whether that's you want to climb the leadership ladder, whether that's you want to go into operations versus sales, whether that's you want to go into training, whether that's you want to be a podcaster, whether that like I, whatever that thing is, right? Like yeah. it's there's not a wrong answer to me. And I think mm -hmm. leaders make a big mistake and I think employees may make this mistake too, where it's like we hide, mm. you know, employees hide what their real ambition is because it doesn't quote unquote align with the corporate agenda. Yes. And leaders make the mistake of not really getting in the world of their people. So listen, listen, I have a I have a guy right now that does real estate on the side. I have a guy that has an insurance company and does Turo on the side. I got a guy that is a pastor on the weekends. I got a like it to so to so to so to completely dismiss anything that's involved outside of the four walls and the conversations in that organization, both for the employee and the employer, I think it, I think it may shortcut some opportunity there. Right. Yeah. Um, and so once a month I have those career pathing conversations and, and there is no, 
conversation off limits. I'm okay if this isn't your forever home. Candidly, when I started at my organization, it wasn't my forever home. And I'm 12 years in. So like, <laughs> like, I was ready to leave after like I walked in and was like two years, I'm out. Right. <laughs> Here I am 12 years later, like life happens. So um yeah, yeah and one-on-ones, it's 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 much less structured. And I try to open a door for people to express what's going on in their world. And um, you know, I think as leaders, it's really important that we understand that like they have life. And yeah. um, if we don't connect with them, like people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, and I, I try to use that one-on-one time to to express that. Oh, I love that, John. That's so good. And I I have to put the caveat out there though, because I know somebody is gonna be like, if I share that information, it's gonna get me fired. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Fair. I know that that's get coming. It. And I think that that is where you obviously have built trust with your employees, where they know that that's not the case. Yeah. And I think that when we're talking about, you know, these experiences that people have had in their past and all of that, like, obviously we have to honor that, but yeah. you as an employee also have to look at the person that is managing you and you read the room, right? Like, totally. you know, <laughs> yep. you know, if they're going to be out to get you, you, yeah. you have an inclination, right? Based yeah. on how they're talking to you, the questions that they're asking you, all of that. So yeah. if it's not a safe environment for you to yeah. talk about your totally. career or the things that you're passionate about, don't do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and like the 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 like the easy thing again, like I'm in sales, so it's like so to bring up your side hustle when you're 50% of your quota is probably not a great idea, right? Like again, like it's like, you know, it to to ask for 2 weeks off to go do something that you're passionate about that isn't company aligned when you're, you know, 52% of plan, like not great. Right. But there's people that are, I listen, I, I will be, I will be the first one to say, like, I have told some of my salespeople before, Hey, you're 200% of plan. If you want to take a month and like, go do whatever, like, I, like, and I, listen, that is, I'm saying that now because I think it's really important that like performance does matter. Mm -hmm. Like if, so, so I think that there's a, I think you, you mentioned earlier, it's like, there's this narrative out there that it's like, well, like you got to go, like you got to do your own thing. You got to, it's like, yes. And um, if the employer that you're working for is paying your mortgage and is paying your car note and is paying for daycare and it's been like, mm -hmm. I love your passion, <laughs> but you have to be able, like, we have to, and myself included, I have to be able to honor the fact that that's happening and not just be like, well, they don't deserve my work ethic because I'm not good. Like, so, so I think there's a balance there. Yeah. Um, and I think to your point, just, just read the room and you'll know. And like, you know, if you, it, but, but just know that like the, the blanket statement of like, well, I'm an employee, so I'm more, I'm as valuable. Like, yes. And just be aware. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> and yeah, it can't be those absolute statements. You know, there's always yeah. an and, there's always a but, like, there's always something else that needs to be considered. Totally. Yeah. So, okay, this is a perfect segue into talking about PIPs, which is performance improvement yes. plans. Some organizations have different names, but that's like the most common name. So, talk to me about how you handle that. How does somebody even get to that point? Can yeah. they recover? Like, let's lay it out for everybody. <laughs> okay. So performance plans to me, I got told yesterday that I was good at this, which I don't really know. I, I don't know. I don't really know how to take that, but I'm going to take it as a positive and just keep it rolling. Um, so listen, performance plans to answer your last question. Can people come back with it from it? Absolutely. Right. Um, I think it comes when, to me, the people that I've ever per put on performance plans is they're either checked out or they're not coachable. Mm. Um, it, it, it kind of, it usually falls into one of those two buckets. Right. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's one's better than the other. It just means, um, you know, most people fall into the, one of those two buckets. Now, every once in a while, somebody will fall into the bucket of, Hey, this job is just not for them. We hired you. We thought your experience. And by the way, you thought it. We thought it. We thought it was awesome. We're six months into this thing. You're miserable. We're not pumped because the performance isn't there. The show up every like my line to all of everybody that I ever put on a performance plan is like, if it's especially if it's not a fit, we spend way too much time at work to be miserable. 
Like, yes, you're stressed. We're frustrated with your performance. Let's just go find something different. Like that, <laughs> right? But the majority of performance plans is like, hey, we've coached you for again, I work in corporate America, so the HR red tape is real. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I can't just, you know, I can't just be like, you're a performance plan today, right? I gotta coach you to that. So my encouragement to the employer, the employees listening to this is like, if you're getting continual coaching, the coaching isn't because your leader's bored. Like, mm -hmm. like the coaching is for a reason. And the coaching is to get you better because usually it's not, hey, we need you to get better because you're awesome so far. So we want to get you to the next level. Usually the coaching is, especially if it's continual and it's and it's pretty consistent. If the coaching is corrective in, in a lot of cases, it's you take take that as a sign of like, all right, if I was way above what the expectation was, would I be getting this much corrective mm -hmm. or constructive criticism? I don't, I don't know that I would. Mm -hmm. Take that as a sign. And, and I had one employee do this ever. So it's very difficult to do. The best thing you can do is if you feel that tension, ask your supervisor, like ask your leader. And just say, hey, I just want to check in because again, this is me as a leader talking now. Like, I don't like telling you you don't or you're not doing good. <laughs> like, so I use coaching kind of as a mask of like, mm -hmm. hey, maybe try this, maybe try that. And in the back of my head, I'm having conversations with my leader going, I don't know if they're gonna make it because they're doing mm -hmm. this wrong and that wrong, and then I'm coaching them there and they're not doing this. And like, so if you are feeling that tension and you're not getting the directness of, hey, if we don't see a change in 60 days, this is the deal ask the question, like mm -hmm. own that. I'm a big believer in owning your career. Um, and you know, you may not love the answer, but at least you'll be clear. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we got to discuss this a little bit more because I think what happens and I, I, I hear this from people. I didn't see the pip coming. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't see it. No, there yeah. were signs. Totally. I hate, I hate to break it to you, but yep. there were signs. Now, is every manager and every HR person good at their job and doing the PIP the right yeah. way? No, there's always going to be outliers. Always going to be outliers. But yep. I would say for the majority of people, the signs were there. How the manager is talking to you, what yeah. they're talking to you about. You know, if it is this constructive criticism that you're constantly getting feedback on, that's your sign that something yep. is not clicking, something is not working. And so I yep. just want to encourage everybody out there, if that's what it's starting to feel like for you, I love it. Go talk to your manager. Because if yeah. they're giving you the feedback, then it means that they think that you can improve. Totally. But if you're putting that wall up, you know, for yourself, maybe a past experience, again, we've been talking about that throughout this episode. If a past experience is making you put that wall up, or you're getting bad advice from people who yeah really aren't qualified to give you good career advice, totally. then it's it's not going to work in your favor. So yeah, being yep. open, being honest, asking for that feedback as an employee, I think that's so, so important. Yes. Yep. <laughs> okay. In that same vein, let's talk about growth in, in our positions, right? So we're, we're doing things well, you have your team. How do you keep them growing? I feel like especially within sales, you know, what are the opportunities there when you have those people who are really hitting and blowing their targets out yeah. of the water? Or maybe they've been doing so well that they get bored, right? What does that look like? How do you compensate for that as a leader? Yeah, like, listen, salespeople are inherently ADD. So they get bored real quick. Uh, so myself included. So full disclosure, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enemy number one in that category, right? So um, yeah, like, it's, it's interesting. Um, when 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 people are doing well, I try to I try to cultivate a leadership of growth. And the way that I do that is like every every quarter, um, we have leadership like uh, we have we have leadership slash growth roundtable. So I want to understand like where you want to go, mm -hmm. right? Um, again, like you know, I lead a, a group of twenty five individuals now through three teams. So like it's it's more of a macro event more than a one on one setting. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like. I go back to the, what I just said in the, in the last question, which is like, own your career. Like I was told this very early on, if you're doing really well and you're bored in your position or you want to grow somewhere or you want to explore diff different avenues or whatever, like this is going to sound really drastic on this pod, but like ain't nobody coming to save you. 
Like, like you got to do it. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like you gotta, like, you know, you gotta put your big boy, big girl panties on and be Mm -hmm. like, here we go. Like, okay, this is what I want to do. And, and just newsflash for everybody. If that's the, if that's what you're going to do, don't expect a hundred percent support from your supervisor that wants to keep you on their team forever. Okay. So like, don't, don't get discouraged and be like, oh, Andy's going to be mad. Yeah. He's not gonna be pumped. He's losing a really good producer. Like, what did you think was going to happen? Cause guess what? Andy's got to go do. If you leave and he's got to go hire somebody else, got to train him up. He's got to see if the, right it's 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 the nature of so i'm i'm saying that in a little a little bit in a humorous way because it's like it's that's I've, i have yet to leave a position even for going for a better one even when i was approached to go for a better one mm-hmm. that my leader was not like are you sure you want to like they were kind of coercing me out of it because they didn't want right <laughs> and so i say that because you even though you you know hopefully you get into an organization that has a, gr- a le- growth and leadership you know culture Mm-hmm. Um, what I've found is most organizations don't intentionally. What mm-hmm. I've found is most organizations as a macro may, but micro don't mm-hmm. because leaders are afraid of going and having to find new talent and develop and grow and mature because it's freaking work. Yep. <laughs> like, yep. <laughs> like it's work. So again, like, you know, um, as candid as I can be in that question is like, own your career. If you're doing well, own it right? It's okay to ask questions, expect pushback, expect, you know, and, and don't, and here's, here's the other thing in this. I feel like this is an appropriate time to say this is like, don't hold it against your leader. If they're trying to show you things that you may not see, that's not a hundred percent positive. They're not mm. trying to be discouraging to you as a person. They're looking out for their best interest because they're human. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So yes. like, don't be you know, I, I I heard this very early on. It's like, try not to follow people, follow principles. If you mm. if the person has the principles and the character you admire, that's the leader you want to follow. But even that leader is going to disappoint you every once in a while. And usually, Absolutely. this circumstance is one that you're going to be like, "Dang, I didn't I didn't see that coming from Andy." Mm-hmm. Like he's usually so supportive. Mary's usually so sweet. Mm-hmm. It's not because they're mean. It's not because their character changed. It's just because they're human. And all they're thinking about in the back of their head is like, dang, it took me six candidates to get you. I'm gonna have to go find like it's gonna take nine months to come get you again. Right. So yeah, just know that as you as you grow, own that, own, you know, own what that looks like. Um, and and know that the opposition isn't isn't for any other reason than if people didn't want to keep you, they'd be like, Great, see you later. Right. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. It's a good sign that you're that you're at a precipice of um you know, of something that that could be, you know, the next step in your journey. Yes. Okay. Oh, man, I have so many things. I have so many things. Um, (laughs) First is not putting people on pedestals. That was one thing that I learned very early in my career. That example that you gave is exactly what I went through. I had certain people in the organization that I looked up to that I wanted to be like, and all of them let me down in big ways, really big ways. And I really changed, and I was a I was career coaching at that time, and I really changed my narrative with my clients on how we talked about mentors and people in yeah. your sphere and all of that. And I talk about it very differently than most other career coaches because I always put the caveat that these are real people and they're going to let you down. So anybody that you currently have on a pedestal that you think might save you, that has promised you something, that wants to pull you, whatever it is, yeah. It, do not bank on that at all. Yep. Like you cannot bank on people because you just don't know what's going to happen. And th- at the end of the day, they're going to look out for themselves as well before they're going to look out for somebody else because that's just human nature yeah. as we've been talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. I also have to give a shameless plug for myself because <laughs> this podcast obviously is called Control Your Career. Um, one of my higher ticket coaching items is called Control Your Career. And that is really the message that I try to put out to clients and to ambitious professionals is you need to control your career. So many of us, and I would say, especially in that millennial age bracket, um, we were pushed into certain career paths for a lot of different reasons for our parents. We went to college and, you know, we liked a professor and they pushed us into a path, friends, whatever it was. 
Yeah. And I'm seeing a lot now at this point, especially post pandemic going, I don't like this work. I don't like where I'm at. I don't like what I'm doing. And this is such a common thing that I hear. So I love that you're talking about this because I think that so many people are in that place of, I need to rediscover who I am and take on a a new career path that's really going to make me happier you know, or allow me to grow in a way that I wasn't thinking about. So anyway, if that sounds like you, you might want to do a clarity call with me. (laughs) Well, and I will tell you not to, and and for full disclosure, Julia Julia did not tell me that 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 was one of her product, but I will tell y'all, whoever's considering it, the only reason I went and I've grown three levels in the organization in nine years is because I was coached properly on how to control my career. So I'm just telling whoever is considering that, like nobody's gonna, nobody will hold your hand there Mm -hmm. because whoever you're leaving, you're leaving a gap for. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to help you as much as they love you. Right. So whatever that, I don't know what it costs. I don't know (laughs) what it is, but I'm telling y'all, if you can learn how to control your career, and really be able to scale within the organization, big, small, public, private. Um, like, listen, I, I was, I was, and this is, this is not because of me. It was because of how I was coached. Because I controlled my career. I'm the, I was when I became a VP here. I was the youngest VP in the country. It's mm. not because I was better. Because I was better equipped to, con- to control the path. Right. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Uh, food for thought. Yes. Yes. And I did not. Johnny, I did not coordinate this. He is not one of my clients. Just worked out. (laughs) It's just worked out in the conversation. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So let's let's wrap it up. I think we have given everybody so much to consider through this episode. But if you could give current employees any advice to be successful in their position and specifically with their manager, what would that be? Um. I I would give two pieces. I would give the age old, um, be true to yourself. Um, in today, you you mentioned it just briefly just now. I feel like we have a lot of people that are in the twenty five to forty five year old range that are caught that have uh that have gotten into a career that are at a point where they're living a life that their mortgage depends on it, their family depends on it. Um, and their passion is not in it. And, um, and I feel like you can only go so far there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to just completely 180, but I think being honest, um, there's a lot of, I think a lot of people that work in a lot of organizations, you'd be very surprised at what other career opportunities exist based on what your true passion is. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would encourage you to, to be true to yourself and just have that conversation. And then the other part of that is like, I would seek counsel on how to have that those those tough conversations with with your leadership. Sometimes it's really hard, you know. Um, every leader is different, and candidly, every leader is different every minute of every day because they're dealing with ninety seven things: some good, <laughs> some bad, some tentious, some great, some celebratory. Right? Um, I think just seeking wise counsel um, from people that have had those conversations with leaders in the organization. Maybe not even yours. Maybe it's mm-hmm. just, hey, I'm I'm about to have a really tough conversation. Find a mentor that you can just that, that has done what you're trying to do in some yes. shape, form, or capacity. I gotta tell y'all, like I'm blown away, even at my organization. I have yet to find in 12 years me reaching out to one person that it's like, hey, I want to, I want to run something by you, or hey, can you mentor me on how to have this conversation? Whatever. I have yet to get a no. Mm-hmm. And it's not because the organization is great, it's just because I think people operate in silos unnecessarily. And I think if you're just willing to just take the take the step of faith a little bit to just reach out to somebody, it's like, they don't even know you. They're, they could live, right? Like I live in Texas. They could live in Michigan. They don't know me from a hole in the wall, right? Mm-hmm. But if I just reach out and say, hey, this is who I am. I know you did this, this, and this a couple of years ago. I just, can I have a 15 minute pocket of time in the next couple of weeks just to, I want to have a conversation professionally and I want to come across well and I hurt, you know, I would I would just encourage you to like you don't have to go all 180. You don't have to be like, mm-hmm. well, that my leader's got to figure it out. Type of that. Have the have the have the conversation with a mentor or somebody that can coach you through having those tough conversations. And every single time somebody's had a tough conversation with me as a leader, I have more respect for them, whether I like the conversation or not, because I know the conversation's hard. 
Yeah. Like it's, it's a hard, it's hard, right? Yes. So yes. Um, even though it takes courage to do it, you know, I tell people all the time, like having courageous conversations, you know, increases your, your Q score with me mm-hmm. um, because I know how much angst that takes to fight through and, and, and have it anyway. And, and hopefully you work for a leader that, you know, that respects that, that courage and that, uh, that grit to be able to have the tough conversations, even if it may not be something they want to hear. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Yes. Ah, John, this has been such an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. I'm going to put your LinkedIn profile in the blog post for this episode so that people can connect with you, follow you. You post some amazing content on LinkedIn. So I highly recommend that people do that. But thank you so much for being a guest and taking the time to be here. Of course. My pleasure. 